Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to delve into the different physician branches or specialties. Just to start off with, what is a physician? Most people know what a GP is and what a surgeon is, but not everyone knows exactly what a physician does. Well, the formal description is specialists in internal medicine, so diseases and complaints that happen inside your body. And even if that sounds unfamiliar, you've almost certainly heard of a lot of the areas that this covers, like cardiology, diabetes, allergies, palliative care, infectious disease and neurology. These are all branches of medicine or specialties that physicians are responsible for. In each coming episode of Case Notes, we will pick one of these specialties and delve into its history, looking at its development over hundreds of years and some of the interesting stories and cases from the past. We'll also talk to a current physician working in that area to find out what it is like to be working as a specialist physician in the 21st century. This episode of Case Notes will explore the history of ophthalmology, or diseases and treatments of the eyes. Then we'll talk to Dr Justin McKee, a specialist currently working in the field of medical ophthalmology. As usual, we'll end up with a case study. In this episode, Justin will be talking more about a historical figure who inspires him. The eyes are probably, although they compete with the skin for this accolade, the part of the body which has been the most popular with quacks and unorthodox healers who suggested a whole range of dubious cures for eye diseases. Handwritten domestic recipe books from the 1700s contained many home remedies for eye complaints, including one for to slay the worms in the eyes. One recipe book, owned by Mary Sayer, dating from 1717, contained a recipe for sore eyes which included rose water and frog spawn water, to be well mixed and then used to wash the eyes. One printed collection of recipes, John Moncrief's Poor Man's Physician, published in 1731, contained a wide range of typical 18th century treatments for eye complaints. For amaurosis, Moncrief recommended a vesicatory plaster, which is a plaster which contains an irritating substance which will cause blistering to the skin, applied over the whole head, being shaven, in the form of a cap. In the same book, the cure for watering eyes is, quote, pigeon's blood put hot into the eyes, or quicksilver put into the eyes. In case you don't know, quicksilver is mercury, and you can imagine the sort of harm that would result from putting mercury directly into your eyes. Other treatments for eye complaints from Moncrief's poor man's physician included to make an oil from burnt rags mixed with the spittle and laid on with a feather. The gall of fishes, partridge, chicken, goose or ox mixed with honey, fresh cheese, the white of an egg, a roasted apple, goat's flesh, veal or mutton applied to the eyes, leeches behind the ears, butter and the juice of tobacco applied to the eye. And a more simple option was to, quote, set the patient upon a seat straight, take hold on both sides of his head and shake it. Another publication, this one dating from 1785, Peter Taylor's Ready Doctor, had many similar treatments, including partridge gall, egg whites, the juice of onions blown into the eyes, white snails bruised with women's milk applied to the eyes. But on the plus side, at least Taylor pointed out to his readers that, quote, Observe none of these can be done without pain, that is to say, the operation cannot be performed without great pain to the afflicted patient. The medicines recommended in these popular and folk treatments were very similar to those recommended by more formal or respected authorities. The pharmacopoeias, or texts of recommended medicines, produced by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh and the Royal College of Physicians of London also contained recipes for eye complaints which contained eggs, vinegar, rose water and apples. All of this is pretty far removed from what we understand as being ophthalmology today, and it was really only in the 1800s that this specialty in its modern sense began to take form. A rush of texts specifically focused on diseases of the eyes were published around this time, 
the physician Thomas Young carried out experiments to uncover the role which the lens and the cornea played in human sight. The proliferation of print in all its forms in the early 1800s, in advertising newspapers and chapbooks, which were a form of cheaply made, small, disposable books, led to people being more aware of minor deficiencies in their sight, and led to a wave of public concern about the damaging effect of this new media on human vision. The increase in so-called white-collar jobs, such as clerks and copyists, meant both that increasing numbers of people were reliant on the precision of their vision to do their work, but that also fears of the damage of eye strain to both individuals and the economy more generally grew. In the second half of the 1800s, texts such as Solbert Wells' work on diseases of the eye, as well as Hermann von Helmholtz's introduction of the ophthalmoscope, began a process of increasing specialisation of eye complaints and the development of more clinical and sophisticated treatments than had existed previously. Charles Darwin, conducting his own research on the function of the eye, wrote that he was, quote, Surprised that any of us have eyes at all, seeing what a frightful number of horrid diseases the eye is liable to. At this time, eye clinics and eye hospitals began to be established in Britain, continental Europe and America. This began the professionalisation of ophthalmology and the separation of specialists from quackish healers and itinerant surgeons. Ophthalmologists treated an array of complaints, including cataracts, conjunctivitis, inflammations of the eye, ophthalmia and spots on the cornea, although many important developments, including laser treatment, cornea transplantations and vacuum cataract extraction were still to take place. By the late 1800s it had been established that ophthalmology was a separate and distinct specialty, the preserve of trained physicians and surgeons, rather than the collection of strange and dubious healing methods which had been in use only a few decades earlier. Well, thank you for joining us here today. Um, we have Dr. Justin McKee with us. I wondered if you could just start off by just saying who you are and where you work. Uh, sure. So I am Justin McKee. Um, I'm a consultant in medical ophthalmology and I work at the Princess Alexandra Eye Pavilion and also at the Department of Clinical Neurology in Edinburgh. Fantastic, thank you. So I suppose we'd better start with the absolute basics. So what is ophthalmology? Uh, yeah, so ophthalmology is the medical specialty involved in the management of eye disease and the preservation of sight. That's nicely succinct and, and <laughs> sounds very uncomplicated. Um, I'm <laughs> sure we will find out that it isn't shortly. But so is there anything that would surprise people about ophthalmology or are there any sort of stereotypes about your specialty and the work that you do? Um, so I think that um, certainly before I went into eyes, um, you know, I sort of thought that it was just one big specialty but it's actually highly sort of subspecialized within ophthalmology. So, um, so for example, you have people that specialize in cornea, which is the sort of transparent part of the front of the eye. There's a whole subspecialty devoted to that. Um, there's people that specialize in glaucoma, um, which is re sort of one disease, but it actually is so common and so complex that, you know, there's a whole subspecialty devoted to that. Um, I think some people would probably be surprised about um, medical ophthalmology, which is the sort of subspecialty that I do. So I um, actually sort of was initially a physician trained and then went into eye training um, to focus more on the medical uh, and non-surgical aspects of ophthalmology. Um, and it's one of the sort of banes of my life is trying to explain medical ophthalmology to people. So it's good to get the opportunity to, to do this. Um, I think um, in terms of um, sort of surprising things or misconceptions, um, I don't think most people are aware that ophthalmology departments actually have the highest number of outpatient attendances outside of A&E. So they're actually, it's actually an incredibly busy outpatient specialty. I think it's seen as quite a small specialty, but it's actually, you know, has a very, very high um, number of patients that attend. Thank you. And yes, I will be one of the people on the list who is surprised to discover that. So obviously you've, you've mentioned that there are different aspects to ophthalmology, but kind of focusing on, on your area, 
Could you talk us through, is there such a thing as a day in the life of what you do, or is it so varied that that's actually very difficult to, to tell us what an average day would be like? I mean, my, um, my days, the sort of structure of my days are quite um, uh, typical in the sense that I spend most of my clinical life in the outpatient clinic. Um, and I have, a, um, you know, a few days a week where I'm in clinic sort of morning and afternoon. And then outside of that, I'll have sessions uh, for administration and uh, teaching and so on. Um, the variability comes in in the nature of those clinics for me. So I go from um, diabetic retinopathy to neuro-ophthalmology to uh, thyroid eye disease to um, uveitis, which is sort of um, how we describe ocular inflammation. Um and um so and and there's huge variability you know it's all eyes but i find it very various and very, and very interesting um but you know I, i'm I, as i say i'm a medical ophthalmologist so that's my sort of niche um most ophthalmologists they will have you know two uh, you know well one or two sometimes three theater sessions a week obviously where they're operating in addition to being in clinic um uh, other ophthalmologists might have sessions where they do laser, um, you know, for, for, for a clinical session. Um, but ophthalmologists can also be involved in things like diabetic retinal screening, which is actually an incredibly successful uh, screening program that we have in the UK. And we also do things like joint clinics. So I do joint clinics alongside the endocrinologists for thyroid eye disease. Um, and but there's also ophthalmologists that do clinics alongside geneticists for you know genetic eye disease um, and also sometimes my colleagues will operate alongside other specialties so they'll be operating alongside neurosurgery or ear nose and throat because obviously the eye and the orbit interact with with those other kind of head and neck specialties maxillofacial um, and plastic surgery and so on so um, it is actually again you know very varied between different ophthalmologists yeah um, so I'm interested to know, you know, in terms of your career thus far, it, this might be tricky, you're, I've given that you're, you're um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this, not particularly old, um, but over the course of your <laughs> career, you know, have you seen many particularly interesting cases or interesting diseases that you could talk about with us? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I like about my job is that we do actually see, you know, really rare conditions, particularly in medical ophthalmology. So, you know, I'll see patients not infrequently with things like Bechet's disease um, and sarcoidosis. Um, so, you know, we, we're often called upon in, in patients with these rare diseases to sort of look at the eye aspects of it or sometimes make the diagnosis initially in the eyes. Um, but we also, the things that I find really fascinating are these kind of hard to explain um, phenomena. So there's a condition called Anton syndrome where we know that the patient is blind. They might have had, or commonly they'll have had a stroke affecting, you know, the occipital lobe, the um, visual part of the brain. But the patient's convinced that they can see and they sort of confabulate around this. And, and sometimes, you know, they're, it takes a while for their carers and family to notice that the patient's actually blind because they're doing such a good job of convincing people they can see. And then mu much more commonly than that, there's a thing called Charles de Bonnet syndrome where um, again, patients are blind, um, but it's, it's actually very common that they'll describe visual hallucinations. They'll often see like, um, you know, many people or objects or, you know, th these can be very varied. Um, and again, I we don't fully understand these phenomena, but they are really interesting when you see them. We also see a lot or something that I increasingly find interesting is what we call functional neurological disease manifesting as visual impairment. So that's when we don't have a physical cause for a patient's visual impairment, um, but they do have visual uh, you know, disability. And we think of it as more of a software problem. Um, than a, than a hardware or, you know, a physical problem um, with the brain or the eye. And the other thing that I find really interesting and, and is, I think is very important for all, all ophthalmologists are, you know, that we, we can often be the first um, specialty that will see a patient who has, you know, the first sign of 
uh, you know, a life-threatening disease. So there's a condition called neuromyelitis optica, where, who might, which might prevent, present initially with an optic neuritis. And it's very important for us to think about this condition because, you know, I've seen cases that have then ended up with um, respiratory arrest because the nerves supplying their chest have stopped working. Um, and we also sometimes see things like leukemias presenting initially in the eye, um, and we see quite a lot of, um, you know, brain tumours that will come first to the eye clinic. So, um, uh, you know, th that's the range of things that, that I find most interesting and important in, in my sort of clinical practice. But we see lots of, of interesting cases and interesting people. <laughs> No, thank you. That's really interesting. And it, and it sounds like, you know, a, a big chunk of what you do interconnects very close. You know, you're talking about oncology, you know, you're talking about respiratory. So, so working with eyes then interconnects with all these different specialties, presumably. And, you know, do you, do you work quite closely with other aspects of, uh, you know, diabetes specialists and, and so on in your work? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, many ophthalmologists will um, uh, work alongside and interact with, you know, other medical specialties. I think that's one of the reasons why medical ophthalmology, which I do, sort of came into being, or one of the things that we, how we sort of define ourselves is that we, we speak ophthalmology, but we also speak medicine. So, um, you know, and that sounds like a kind of weird thing to say, but the two worlds can be quite different. And I think it can be, there is a, there can be a temptation in ophthalmology to sort of um, get into a kind of silo in the eye clinic and not interact with other specialties. But um, there's so many patients that needs that communication between their specialists. So, um, and I, I, I really enjoy it. I, I really enjoy sort of forming networks and and um you know channels of communication with with other specialties so people you know as i say endocrinology um and diabetes um infectious disease sexual health neurology rheumatology renal medicine um i've probably missed a few out but you know there's lots of different subspecialty uh, different specialties that i end up interacting with frequently yeah no that's a even if you have missed a couple out that's a pretty impressive list <laughs> Um, so over the course of your career thus far, you know, have there been significant changes in ophthalmology that you've, you've experienced, either in terms of patients or, or diagnosis or, or treatment? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's been there's been loads of changes, actually. Um, so um, uveitis, which is one of the one of the big parts of my job, um, treatments have um improved i think so we have increased access to what we call biologic therapies uh, for uveitis um uh which you know are, can be you know much more effective in, in patients compared to other you know forms of immunosuppression and we also have developed or you know the, the, we now have um intra you know forms of steroids that can be injected directly into the eye which can sometimes stay, save us from you know giving patients uh systemic steroids which can have you know a lot of side effects so being able to avoid that in some cases can can be really helpful um when i started in ophthalmology just as I started in ophthalmology, we were sort of entering the era, which I think most people are, are kind of familiar with from relatives and so on, of um, injecting the eye with um, anti-VEGF class of drugs. Um, they were initially used for macular degeneration, and then very much as I started in ophthalmology, they started to be used in diabetic eye disease. And um, these have been very transformative because um, those conditions you know, didn't have as, didn't, didn't really have very good treatments before these injections came about, but they've also brought their own challenges with them. So people are coming, you know, on a monthly basis to the eye clinic, which is a, a big resource implication for, you know, um, setting up clinics and also um, a burden for the patient, you know, often elderly patients like coming in on a sort of monthly basis for injections. Um, something that I'm increasingly noticing actually a little bit outside of eyes, but in diabetes, I'm kind of amazed at the transformation in diabetes care, particularly in the last few years. So type one diabetics, um, having insulin pumps, 
and uh, continuous glucose monitors and sometimes those talking to each other and, and really helping people that have struggled with their blood sugar control improve. And um, type 2 diabetics now have GLP-1 analog injections, which again have really helped with their control. And, um, you know, the burden of diabetes is so huge that, and, and these are such recent developments, we've not seen an impact of that in, you know, diabetic retinopathy, which is still a big part of what we do in eye clinics. But it may be in the future that these, you know, this, this really, really amazing improvement in control in diabetes might, might change things. Um, and the other big thing that's changed as I've been in ophthalmology is our use of technology. So we um, now em employ, um, you know, in most patients, uh, particularly in my practice and people like me, um, retinal um, digital imaging. So that can be in the form of digital photographs and we can get these really nice wide field photographs where we can see the, almost the whole of the retina. And we also use um, a machine called uh, optical coherence tomography, which is a bit like um, ultrasound. Uh, and we do use ultrasound in eyes as well, but it's a bit like ultrasound in that it uses near infrared because the eyes got a clear, um, you know, ocular medium that you can use light signals through. And it gives us these um, cross-sectional, very, very high magnification detailed scans of the retina. So when I first started, these were just used in macular disease, but now we use them lots in things like neuro-ophthalmology and glaucoma. And all of these imaging techniques, they give us really um, good sort of baseline set of investigations in a patient. And then we can really tell what's changing um, as we follow a patient up, which is something that it was much harder to do when we didn't have these techniques. So I think they're really improving patient care but it's almost like a new skill set, you know, to learn how to use all these imaging tools. Thank you. That was really interesting. So I suppose we've, we've done a bit of the, the past now, and I'm, I'm interested to ask you now about the future. You know, where do you see ophthalmology being in three, five, maybe even 10 years time? What are the changes you expect to see? Um, well, I think in my personal practice, one of the big things is that, that I uh that weighs on my mind are the side effect of steroids so i'm using a lot of steroids in patients and i'd really love to um you know in the future move away from using steroids or i don't you know if pharmacology can somehow develop uh you know I mean, we have alternative drugs but in some situations you just you know there's nothing that's as effective as steroids and um but they just have such a big side effect burden that I'd really love if we could move away from that. Um, and as I've said, you know, with these injection therapies, you know, at the moment they're used on a monthly basis and so on. So there are, in development, there are some new drugs and also some new ways of delivering the drugs. Like, um, you know, there's something that's being trialed at the moment, which is actually like a small reservoir of the drug that sits in the eye and then slowly re releases it. Um, so being able to, you know, to treat these conditions without patients having to come so frequently for injections would be would be brilliant. Um, I think another thing that's going to be a big area in ophthalmology, you know, I've talked about um, how much imaging we use. You know, we are sometimes like many sort of radiologists. And um, with that, I think artificial intelligence um, is, you know, is already actually quite advanced in, in the development of using these images to diagnose help us to diagnose um, eye disease. But I think that's very much going to be to help us to deal with our increased disease burden with the aging population, rather than replacing an ophthalmologist. Because I think, you know, anyone who, who, who works with artificial intelligence, you know, anyone that I've spoken to who, who, who has expertise in it feels that it's always going to need a bit of human guidance and, you know, obviously a human sort of touch when you're interacting with patients and so on. Um, there's also quite a lot going on, uh, work going on with genetics. So it may be that in the future we can use, you know, um, uh, genetic profiles to help us personalize patient care in common conditions like glaucoma and macular degeneration, which can have quite variable outcomes in different patients. So it might be the patient's genes help us to 
identify who's going, who needs more aggressive treatment, who we don't need to treat so aggressively, et cetera. Um, and locally in Edinburgh, we're very excited about the future because we, um, after a few wobbles along the way, we're pretty sure that we're going to get a new eye pavilion <laughs> down at the down at the Royal Infirmary. So that's very exciting. But I think the time scale is going to be quite a few years just yet. But yeah. That was going to be my first question was when. Um, but yeah, these, as you say, these things take a, take a little while to, to bring together. But no, that's, that's really positive. So I suppose, you know, sticking with the future, thinking about, you know, the, the next generation of specialists. So there may be people listening to this who are, you know, medical students thinking about how to specialise or even people who are, you know, prior to going to university thinking about studying medicine and, and specialising. So I'm interested to know, you know, what advice could you offer to students who are thinking about a career in ophthalmology or whose, whose options are open to the idea? Well, I think I would, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, as I say, I do medical ophthalmology, which is a kind of, in a way, a sort of alternative career path into ophthalmology. So I'd urge people not to forget that. And particularly if there's people that are going into, you know, IMT training or going down a medical route to sort of keep it in mind as an option. But it's fair to say that we are um, quite small compared to ophthalmology training, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, where the bulk of ophthalmologists will do their training. And, um, you know, that's a great training scheme and a very rewarding career. Um, but it is fair to say it is quite competitive. So I think if people are thinking about ophthalmology, um, the sooner that you can start uh, working towards that, uh, you know, the better. So many candidates will have done things like um, the Duke Elder exam, when, which is a, an undergraduate ophthalmology exam. Um, you know, they'll, they'll have chosen to do that in, in medical school. And often when they come to apply for ophthalmology training, they'll have done projects relating to ophthalmology, such as a, a research project or quality improvement project. So these things not only, you know, do help you with your application, but also they give you exposure to ophthalmology and give you an insight into, you know, how, um, clinic, how a clinical life in ophthalmology, you know, is. Um, I think, again, thinking about applying to ophthalmology, um, any teaching qualification or evidence of involvement in medical education is always helpful for any application. And certainly education is, is a big part of, of any ophthalmologist's career. Um, and, but in terms of signposting, what I would say is there's the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, the RCOP website, and there's a section on that called Becoming an Ophthalmologist. So I'd encourage people to have a look at that. And there's plenty of links in there about um, what training is like in ophthalmology and how to uh, optimize your chances of, of getting a, a training number in ophthalmology. Anyway, this has been really fascinating. Thank you very much for, for joining us, Justin. Well, thank you very much, Daisy, for having me. In our case study today, Justin explores the history of Patrick Trevor Roper, a hugely important figure in the history of ophthalmology. We are renovating the library at the Eye Pavilion. So we were all sort of taking turns of you know, like shifting boxes and putting things into boxes and things like that. So I was doing it one evening by myself and I got bored and I, I turned around and there was a journal that was open at an obituary page. And the obituary was about a man called Patrick Trevor Roper, who was an ophthalmologist. So he was a consultant in um, Westminster Eye Hospital in Moorfields in London from like the late 40s until the 1980s. So he did lots of things in ophthalmology. So he founded the eye bank, which is where um, sort of post-mortem eye specimens go that can be used for corneal, you know, transplant tissue and that kind of thing. So that's, you know, now he founded the London eye bank and that's now the kind of standard, you know, way that we uh, distribute transplant tissue. And he founded eye, he helped found eye hospitals in Ethiopia and Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Um, he also was influential in fighting the monopoly of optometrists on selling reading glasses. So it used to actually be illegal to buy reading glasses over the counter. <laughs> and he, um, you know, was part of the movement towards, you know, to, to breaking that monopoly. He 
also wrote an interesting book about how eye conditions affected um, different artists and how it influenced their work. But um, the other fascinating thing about him was that he was one of only three named witnesses at the Wolfenden Committee in 1957, which was the committee looking at the legalization of homosexuality. So obviously at the time, being a homosexual was illegal, but he kind of stuck his head above the parapet and was prepared to be named as a witness to the committee. And he talked about how, um, you know, homophobia and blackmail of gay men at the time was, you know, had a big impact on, you know, suicide and, you know, how difficult life was basically for homosexuals at the time. And that eventually went, that committee eventually went on to lead to the decriminalization of homosexuality in, in England and Wales and then later in Scotland. And he was also during the um, early AIDS pandemic, he uh, was one of the founding members of the Terence Higgins Trust which is now one of the most, you know, uh, leading HIV charities in the UK. And the initial meeting of the trust was in his house. So when I read this, I was just very sort of blown away, basically, that, um, you know, an ophthalmologist had had been such a, a leading figure in sort of LGBT rights. And I certainly wasn't expecting it when I started reading the obituary. So... Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage. And we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you.